The sound echoes through the TIA terminal, announcing the arrival of 15-year-old Jennifer Mee. That sound has been her constant companion since the first hick. Four weeks ago tomorrow. Then Jennifer and her parents embarked on a whirlwind media tour, appearing on local and national news shows, hoping someone would be able to offer a solution. None have worked so far. In 2007, 15-year-old Jennifer Mee from St. Petersburg, Florida, became famous after gaining worldwide attention that earned her the nickname, The Hiccup Girl, after becoming stricken with a case of uncontrollable and unstoppable hiccups. She hiccuped 50 times per minute for five weeks straight, but they never subsided completely and would return in bouts on and off again. She tried everything from eating soft foods, including peanut butter, breathing in a bag, standing on her head, and other strange methods, to having someone scare her and was even advised by a friend to try smoking marijuana. I've been to um, neurologists, pediatricians, um, cardiologists, they get MRIs, CAT scans, blood work, everything. <laughs> and nothing. nothing. We've tried <laughs> tablespoons of peanut butter, um, tablespoons of sugar, um, mustard, gallons um, of water, uh -huh. lots of water. Other suggestions have been impractical or illegal. Somebody told me to smoke marijuana, take a hit of marijuana, that would help. Yeah. But you're not going to go that route. Oh, oh definitely not. <laughs> it got so bad, she had to take medicines like Benadryl and Valium to help her sleep and eventually dropped out of school because it was such a disruption. Desperate to find a cure for her affliction, she looked to the world for answers, and as it turned out, the world was listening. Primarily known for the interview she gave to NBC's Today Show, networks and radio stations all over the country were competing with one another to interview her. Eventually, she was treated by a doctor and prescribed a medication called Thorazine, which is commonly used to treat people for Tourette's syndrome, a condition that causes people to suffer from various tics involving repetitive movements or unwanted sounds. For the most part, the treatment did help in calming down her annoying condition. Then three years later, at the age of 19, Jennifer made headline news again when she shocked the nation after she was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. the so-called hiccup girl from St. Pete. You might remember when she first made headlines back in 2007 for hiccups that wouldn't quit. Well, she's in the news again for something much worse. Jennifer Mee is accused of meeting her alleged victim on a social networking site. Police say Mee lured a man to a home while the two men with her robbed him at gunpoint. Jennifer Mee did not speak in court, but standing close to a microphone, her sobbing and hiccuping were amplified as attorney John Trevina argued she should be released from jail. He's arguing that this was a case of me following the wrong crowd. Me, along with two others, LaRon Rayford and Lamont Newton, are accused of killing Shannon Griffin in a robbery. In 2010, Jennifer Mee was living away from home in an apartment complex in St. Petersburg, Florida, with her boyfriend, Lamont Newton, and two other roommates, Lauren Rayford and Jennifer Sharon. Jennifer Sharon stated that she had been at work all day and returned home later that evening to find all three were home. The four of them made plans to watch a movie, Paranormal Activity, but that they, meaning Jennifer Mee, Newton, and Rayford, first needed to go out to get some money, so they left while Sharon stayed behind, unaware of their intentions and not involved in their plan. Sharon would later go on to testify in court for the prosecution as to what she witnessed next after the three arrived back home later that night. The idea that the four would watch a movie together never happened, and Sharon would be the first to witness the aftermath of something that should have never happened, something that would have never happened had Jennifer Mee not initiated the plan. You've heard the phrase, it takes two to tango? In this case, it took three. Shannon Griffin was a 22-year-old young man and once a talented high school football player who transplanted to Florida and got a job working at Walmart after Hurricane Katrina decimated his hometown in Petal, Mississippi. His family described him as a quiet guy who wouldn't hurt a soul. Finding out about his death and that he was murdered was devastating to them, 
Right before they learned he was dead, they were expecting a visit from him for a family get-together that never got to happen and would never happen ever again. Jennifer met Shannon online through a social media platform where the two became friends, yet they never met in person until that fateful night. And remember, she had once been extremely famous and well-known as the Hiccup Girl, and he probably knew this and became flattered that she was even talking to him. At some point, the two planned to meet up, whereas he believed they would be going out on a date. Griffin's cousin, Doug Bolden, spoke to the judge recalling how the 22-year-old was in a great mood when he last saw him just before he was killed. He was going to go on a date. He just thought he was going on a date. Just a young college kid grinning ear to ear, about to go on a date, just happy as can be. According to Griffin's cousin, Doug Bolden, Shannon was very excited about going out on a date with Jennifer. He dressed up in new clothing, put on cologne, and headed out to meet at a location set up by Jennifer. In addition, Jennifer also told him she could hook him up with some people she knew to purchase marijuana. When Shannon arrived in an area in downtown St. Petersburg, he met Jennifer at a vacant house that was up for sale, where she then directed him to walk down an alley beside the house to meet with her two friends that were waiting to sell him the marijuana. And where Shannon would quickly find out, the date and the marijuana transaction were both just a ruse. He had been set up. By the time he rounded the corner at the end of the alley, she started to walk away from the scene, and he was met in the dark by two strangers, Lamont Newton and Laron Rayford, where they tried robbing him at gunpoint. However, they didn't expect Shannon to fight back, and when he didn't submit to them, Laron Rayford used a 38 caliber six-shooter handgun and fired all six shots with four hitting Shannon, three times in the chest and once through the arm killing him. The fourth bullet was found lodged in the overhang of the vacant house. In a panic, Rayford dropped the gun at the scene and he and Newton took off running, leaving Shannon for dead and a mess of evidence, but not before taking his wallet from his pants pocket first, with a small amount of money that was in it. Shannon was shot to death for $50. The first to arrive back home was Jennifer Me. At the time, Jennifer Sharon, the fourth roommate who testified for the prosecution, said that when Jennifer Me arrived back to the apartment, she was out of breath, panicked, and told Sharon she heard gunshots. Then shortly after, and Sharon would later testify, Laron Rayford showed back up looking distraught and like he had been in a fight, and told her that Lamont Newton had been shot. Only Newton was right behind him, and the third showed back up and announced that it wasn't him that was shot, but that another man had been shot, the victim, Shannon Griffin. Rayford and Newton were arrested within a few hours after the crime. At first, Jennifer Mee was not a suspect until they questioned her. During her first interview with the police, she told them a complete lie. She claimed her roommate, Laron Rayford, killed Shannon because Laron, who was also Jennifer Sharon's boyfriend, thought there was a love triangle involving Laron's girlfriend and Shannon, something Sharon testified to as a lie and had first-hand knowledge of the crime after it happened when the three returned to the apartment. Were you faithful to Laron? Yes. Jennifer Mee claimed that Lamont Newton, Jennifer Mee's boyfriend at the time and co-defendant, urged her to confess to the crime and that nothing would happen to her because she was known as the hiccup girl, but that advice would turn out to be wrong and her confession led to her arrest. When police searched the apartment, they found bloody clothing soaking in bleach and Shannon's wallet in an air vent that contained a work ID and his driver's license that had Jennifer Mee's fingerprint on it. But the one thing she didn't count on and ultimately got her convicted was the critical mistake she made during a recorded jailhouse phone call that she made to her mother after her arrest, which implicated her as the so-called mastermind behind the plot to rob Shannon when she told her mother that she set the whole thing up. This call may be recorded or monitored. I have a free call from... Jennifer Hello? Hi, Mama. Hello, Jennifer. What's going on? Why are you in jail? Um, it's first degree murder in the first degree. Who'd you kill? Well, then how are 
In the state of Florida, if someone is involved in a robbery that ends in death, then any person involved can be arrested and charged with first-degree murder, which carries a life or death sentence. John Trevina and Bryant Camarino, Jennifer Meese counsel, two of the best criminal defense attorneys in the area, defended her in court by saying their client was no mastermind and could not have come up with a plan that involved murder. Her lawyers tried playing the mental health card, claiming Jennifer suffered from schizophrenia and Tourette's syndrome, which caused her unmanageable hiccup bouts and questioned whether she was competent to stay in trial. The judge ordered a psychiatric evaluation and determined she knew right from wrong and found her competent to stay in trial and that a jury would hear the case to decide her fate, implementing Florida's culpability law that can find someone guilty of capital murder in a case such as this one. Her lawyers also argued since she didn't expect a murder to happen, nor did she believe a gun would be involved, and not the person who pulled the trigger, that she wasn't guilty of killing Shannon. Prosecutors Jan Olney and Christopher Labruzzo even stated they did not believe Jennifer set out that night intending to participate in a murder, but that she was guilty for setting it up. Before the trial, Jennifer Meese's defense attorneys tried to offer a deal to the prosecution that she would plead guilty in exchange for a 15-year sentence, but the prosecution turned that down, saying they would accept nothing less than starting at 25 years. After learning this, she refused to negotiate a deal, believing she didn't deserve that much time and chose to take it to trial instead. During closing arguments, prosecutors were able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Jennifer Mee was guilty because of her own words from that jailhouse call she made to her mother when she admitted to setting up a robbery that resulted in a death, the murder of Shannon Griffin. In 2013 and three years on trial, the jury deliberated for four hours, finding Jennifer Mee guilty of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole as were her co-defendants, Lamont Newton and LaRon Rayford. She is incarcerated at the Lowell Correctional Institution, a women's prison located in Marion County, north of Ocala. Jennifer Mee blames her fame as the hiccup girl, saying it all went to her head and eventually led her down the wrong path where she surrounded herself with bad people and their negative influence. But it's the choice she made and the lack of putting thought before action that landed her in prison for the rest of her life. Shannon was robbed at gunpoint. At some point, one must believe whether or not they intended to use it, it was included in their plan. They most likely expected him to cooperate, but instead Shannon chose to fight for his life and they chose to end it. He lost his life for less than the cost of a video game I bought my son for Christmas. No, she didn't pull the trigger, and no, she didn't intend for Shannon to die, but she did conspire with two others with every intention to facilitate a plan, to use herself as bait and lure him under false pretenses to trick and rob him that ended his life. Had she been removed from the equation, Shannon would still be alive. 